Very special word of greeting to everybody worshiping at our campuses, to our folks uh, in Kernersville at the Union Cross campus, everybody up in King, and to our Clemens campus. Uh, I'm so happy to be with you. And everyone else who's joining us online at home worship or throughout the week, are you ready for some good news? The devil is a defeated foe whose time is short. And you are, according to the scriptures, an uber conqueror in Christ, destined to reign with God forever. We are in a series I call God Rescue Mary. And uh, it is an invitation to a joyful heart and to not be dismayed. And so we're bringing tidings of comfort and joy. And today I start us in Matthew chapter 2 at verse 13, and then we're going to go to a text that is not your usual Christmas season text, but I think it's going to bless your socks off to see it. Matthew chapter 2 verse 13, now when they had departed, behold, speaking of the Magi, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he'd been tricked by the wise men, became furious and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. And then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. And then this is our essential text, uh, believe it or not, for this Advent day. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. And she gave birth to a male child, one who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Let nothing you dismay. Had a real treat uh, last Saturday, uh, against all odds, was able to go to an in-person college football game at uh, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, was able to go with my wife and join in with my daughter, uh, who uh, is a senior there, and to go to uh, a game, we just so wanted to go to a football game, my daughter's last season there. And uh, only 3,200 or so, 3,500 tickets available out of the 52,000 seat stadium. And we had a, 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 it was a chilly day, but a bright sunny day. And we had a great time. And it wasn't that much of a game because um, uh, the Tar Heels were playing the Catamounts of Western Carolina, of course, who are in a different division. And, uh, but the Catamounts are a noble uh, fighting football team. I remember seeing them a couple of years ago uh, play Carolina, and they gave the Heels a run for their money there for a while. But last Saturday, the Tar Heels offense was clicking at the end of the first half. The score was 42-3. to three. <laughs> uh, UNC quarterback Sam Howell had played a nearly flawless first half, going 20 out of 23 on his passing for 287 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. My wife is too merciful, and I have a problem with her at games like this. When my team gets way ahead, she starts feeling sorry for the opponent. And even my daughter, although she is a Carolina student, though she is there, she begins feeling empathy for Western Carolina as well. I turned to my two women at the end of that first half, it was 42 to 3, and I said, the only bad thing about amassing such a big score is this, is that's the last we're going to see of quarterback Sam Howell today. Sure enough, when the second half began, the backup quarterback was in. His first throw was an interception, a pick six, actually, an interception where the defense runs it all the way back for a touchdown. Thankfully, the touchdown was called back because of a penalty, but that's the way it started. 
throughout that half of football, Carolina played four different quarterbacks by the end of the game. Twelve different Tar Heel players had caught a pass. Ten different players had carried the ball. And most amazing, 26 Tar Heel defensive players had either had a tackle or an assist on a tackle. The Catamounts from Western Carolina played hard against the Heels in the second uh, and, and their third squads. And so it actually became a very close game between Carolina's second and third string against Western uh, Carolina. And so while Carolina, the Tar Heels, scored six touchdowns in the first half, they only scored one touchdown in the second half, and the Catamounts also scored a touchdown, missed their extra point. So technically in the second half, Carolina only beat Western Carolina 7-6. to six. So if you had just watched the second half and you didn't see the scoreboard and you had not seen the first half, then you would have thought this is anybody's ball game. You would have thought that, that, that this was a very tight match. You would have thought that one wrong move and the Tar Heels could have lost. But if you had seen the first half, as we had, then you would have known, no, no, this game is not close at all. It's still being fought hard, but the game was decided long ago. Yeah. If you just look at Christmas at the world and you see a pandemic and you see the hatred and you just watch the news right now, it might have the appearance that there's an undecided spiritual battle that is raging. If all you knew is what you see today, you might think it is unclear whether the devil will win or God will win. If you have not seen the first half, if you have not had a vision of the eternal scoreboard, then your heart might be dismayed and you might worry and you might fret. This was especially important for the first century when Christians are being fed to lions and burned alive and hiding in catacombs under Rome. They, like we, needed to know the real score. They needed to have the heavens opened up enough so they could see the revelation of what happened in the first half. And that's exactly what God did when he had the Apostle John exiled on the island of Potmos amongst the Greek isles. He gave him a revelation to see what was really going on. It was like saying that God wanted him to see the first half. He didn't want the Christians then or now to live and fight in the spiritual battle as if they didn't know what the scoreboard really said. It was interesting, the whole second half of the football game on the field, there's a battle going on and, it, and, it, and the game, the second half, like I said, it was really only seven to six in the second half, but my wife and daughter and I were not worried because we saw the first half. And so when that backup quarterback came in, he threw a pick six on his first throw. We said, rats, that stings. I hate that for him. That hurts. Wow, I wish we hadn't just thrown an interception. But what we didn't say was, oh, no, we might lose. In other words, we did not dismay. In fact, there was nothing in the second half that could make our hearts dismay because we'd seen the first half. And we knew the score and we knew the final outcome of the game. When we say God rest you merry, gentlemen, it doesn't mean, uh, I hope you find some rest, you merry gentlemen. No, rest in Old English meant keep. And the comma comes after merry, not before. And it means, may God keep your heart continually joyful and glad. Though you look around you and you see the world in turmoil, God rest you merry. Let nothing you dismay, for Christ the Lord our Savior was born on Christmas Day. Remember Christ, our Savior, was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we had gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Tidings of comfort and joy. In other words, when you face difficult times and you begin to get worried, remember the first half. Look at the scoreboard. Remember what Jesus has accomplished. And you live your life and you fight the spiritual battle in full assurance that you're going to win and you're going to reign forever. I want to just tell you one really cool thing. At the end of the, of the, of the, uh, of the football game, 
maybe the final play, maybe it was the penultimate play, I'm not sure. But a Tar Heel defensive lineman penetrated the line of scrimmage, got into their backfield early, chased down with a couple quick steps the tailback and sacked him for a loss. I wish I knew who that player was because there was only 10 seconds left in the game. It, the, 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 the score was, was, was 42 to 9. And there was no time almost left in the clock. And yet that defender, when he tackled him and made that sack, he jumped up and he, you'd have thought he'd just won the Super Bowl. And all the other players are giving him high fives and they're doing these chest bumps. And they're just, they're, what a picture. That though the game was decided, the game was still going on. And as long as the game is going on, the players are really fighting it out. Just because you know you're going to win doesn't mean you just go out in the field and lay down and let the opponent run over you, do you? You take your stand, you keep your pads on, you play hard, you play tough. And so that's what, that's what the spiritual battle is really like. It's, it's where we are, beloved. It is to say that we're in a spiritual fight that has already been decided, but the, the skirmishes are still going on, so we're playing it out. We're still playing it out, and we're still fighting, and we're still putting on the full armor of God, and we're still taking our stand against the enemy. And so in the middle of Advent here, I've brought you today to a text not normally read during the Christmas season. Oh, it's not a picture of sugar cake and hot chocolate and cute Christmas ornaments. This is a violent picture of a cosmic battle with eternal consequences. Brothers and sisters who are in a spiritual battle in the second half, I want you to come with me to the Isle of Patmos and show you what John saw. Because in a sense, we're going to have a replay of the first half. So as the devil roars and the mountains shake and confusion lingers, let nothing you dismay. The book of Revelation, the, the, the last book of the Bible, is um, a particular genre that we call apocalyptic literature. It's really important to know that there are different styles of writing or genres, you might call them, in the Bible. Uh, it, think of it this way. When you pick up the newspaper, if you read the newspaper, you don't even think about it, but you know that there are different genres of writing within one newspaper, right? There's the front page headlines. And whatever you see on the front page headlines, whatever's biggest and boldest on that front page, you know that means this is news and it's the most important news of the day. And you expect it to be a factual uh, reporting of major happenings in the, in the community or in the world. But as you come to the end of section A, you might come to the editorial page. And there, you aren't expecting to simply read about facts. You're expecting to read opinions. And there, on that page, you might find editorial cartoons. And those cartoons might have symbols. And if you don't understand the symbols, you might be quite confused. If you saw a cartoon and it had a, an elephant and a donkey in it, and you didn't know that the elephant represents one political party and the donkey represents the other, and they're in a tug-of-war, uh, or they look divided or something like that, you go, what does this have to do with anything? But you understand that that those kind of cartoons, they have symbols to them. And as, and as you read on in the newspaper, you leave the editorial page and you come to section B and you'll come to the sports page where you might see a headline that reads, the Bears maul the Patriots. And if you didn't know anything about football or NFL teams and that they have nicknames and mascots like the Chicago Bears or the New England Patriots, then you might think that people who are patriotic had just been attacked by grizzly bears. So you've you got to know what style of writing, what genre you're reading, or else it won't make sense. So the Bible has different genres within it as well. It's one book. It's written over a long period of time under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and woven together in a miraculous way, but it, it's not full of all of the same kind of writing. And a lot of people get mixed up in the way they're interpreting Scripture, but they don't pay attention to what kind of genre they're in. So here, here's some of the genres of writing in the, in the Bible. There is historical narrative. You read narrative of Joshua taking the promised land, and it's an account of what happened. And There's a lot of historical narrative, just telling the story of what happened for God's people by God's grace throughout history. And of course, there's law. Um, you take like the book of Leviticus, it's just full of lots of different laws and instructions and guidelines that are all intended for the well-being of God's people. 
And of course, there's poetry. And when you read poetry, it has a, it has a, is it a beauty to it. It has a, a fragrance to it. It is like an art. And, and the Psalms are poetry, right? Of course, there's prophecy. And you, and you see them, the major prophets like, like Isaiah and Jeremiah. I mean, we, have, we have smaller books of the Bible that are prophecies that we also see. Hosea and Amos and Jonah and Micah. And, 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 and prophecies are the foretelling of, of God's word and, and telling about things that are to come. And, and then there are, of course, especially you see in the New Testament, epistles or letters that are, are written. Paul, much of the New Testament is Paul has written letters to his congregations that he started. And so that you, you have a certain way that you write when you're writing a letter. And of course, they're gospel narratives. They're light narratives, but they're also, they're so oriented towards telling the story of Jesus and the good news that they read that way. And then, finally, there's this that we call apocalyptic literature. And apocalyptic literature um, is a, a, a quite unique genre. Apocalyptic j- literature, uh, this genre, it comes from the Greek word apocalypsis, apocalypsis which means uh, revelation. So uh, the apocalypse means a revelation. And that's the name of the book, uh, the first book of the Bible. Um, it's a, an apocalypse, a revelation of Jesus Christ. And what we know about apocalyptic literature from what we see in the Bible and other writings from that same era of time is that there are some common characteristics. And these characteristics include the fact that it's almost always about a cosmic conflict. You see a real duality, a battle that's going on of some sort. Also, apocalyptic literature, it is an unveiling, that's what a revelation is, of otherworldly realities. So when you think about apocalyptic literature, it is about sort of pulling the heavens back to see what's going on in another realm and how what's going on in the other realm is actually determining what's happening in this earthly realm. Apocalyptic literature also deals with end times and uses dreams and visions and it uses very vivid images. Um, it's, it's rich. It's like, a, it's like a picture almost. It's rich and, and it has recognizable symbols. So if, if you read apocalyptic literature as if it's historical accounts or if it's law, you'd miss the point, right? So badly that it'd be the, like trying to read the editorial page as if it were the front page or the sports page as if it were the comics. And so oh, I think what's happened with a lot of the uh, way we interpret the book of Revelation is that people have taken it and analyzed it and analyzed it, but it really is not meant to be analyzed as much as it is to be, be taken in and take your breath away and call, call you up into, into a heavenly vision with, with John and to see uh, something glorious and beautiful. It just moves you and stirs you. It's, it, to me, it's more like looking at a painting than it is doing a math problem. And it's sort of like you could think of it visions and dreams. They, they're full of images and symbols. I, I had a dream this past week. It's, it's, uh, it's one I wish I actually would have more often because it's just when I remember that I have it and I can experience how it is just so fun. It feels so good. I dreamt this past week one night I was flying. But in this flying dream, there was sort of a twist to it because I had a small device in my hand and I realized that it was the same size and shape as my Roku remote. <laughs> a little remote. <laughs> like, and you know how remote controls are famous for the battery going off and you're trying to click it and get something to work and it doesn't work and that uses up the batteries too quick. And so I, and the amazing thing about this remote was if I would hold the up button on it, I would just kind of start hovering through the air. I mean, it just, uh, I would just, I sure hope we get to fly in heaven. Just, to, it just, can you feel so good? And the cool thing about this remote was that the two or three people that were close to me, if I flew, they could just fly along with me as long as they stayed real close. But there was a danger if the batteries went out, then I would lose altitude quickly. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that, was, that was my dream. Now, you wake up from a dream like that, and you go, that's so weird. You know, that's just so weird. But when you're dreaming it, have you ever noticed when you're dreaming it, it doesn't seem weird that a Roku remote is enabling me to fly? It only seems weird later when you go back and you analyze it. 
And, uh, and sometimes dreams are just because our unconscious mind's working something out. And sometimes they're from God. I don't know, maybe this was me saying, listen, God, maybe he's saying, Alan, you can soar, but you've got to make sure that your batteries are staying charged if you're really going to go and take people with you. Uh, so as you repo- approach the book of Revelation, it is with the awareness that we're in this different genre that's esoteric and dreamlike. It's not meant to be a book that's just linear and factual nearly as much as it is revelatory, okay? And the revelation that we are given here is of the victory of Jesus Christ. This means, beloved, that the book of Revelation is not given to us so we can predict when Jesus will return. The book of Revelation is given to us so we can be sure that Jesus is on the throne and that he will, in God's perfect timing, come back to this earth for good. The one thing that we know for sure about the timing of Jesus' return is that no one knows when he will return. I don't know why we spend so much time trying to talk about when he's going to come back and write all these books about all the different signs of the time that when he's going to come back, when the one thing we know for sure is Matthew 24, 36, concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. And yet the primary thing we seem to do is we try to make it all about getting our timetables. Well, we come to this text today in Revelation 12 and some huge interpretive questions arise. When you're reading Revelation, and, and, and that question, I wish I, I, mean, I don't have time to go into all of the interpretive issues of Revelation, but one of the questions is, are what we're reading about in all these symbols, is it about stuff that's already happened, or is it mainly about what's going to happen in the future, or is it both? And I'm convinced that it's both. Another question is, is this book of Revelation supposed to be read in a linear fashion, like it's telling about events that happen one after the other, other and go on into the future? Or is it, and this is what I believe, is it more like cycles? And if you read Revelation, you'll see different, different accounts in different ways and different ways the vision shows the victory of Jesus. And so it, it's more like it, it comes back to celebrating the victory of Jesus in a variety of ways. So uh, you determine those things as you come to the book of Revelation. And then to understand it at all, you must understand that apocalyptic literature is laden with symbols. And they're reliable symbols. You know, we have symbols in our own lives and world, and you see it, you, you know what it means. And we're, we're quite familiar with some of the symbols that we see over and over in apocalyptic literature. Let me mention a few of them, most of which occur in our passage today. Um, a crown is a symbol of power. The animal's horn is a symbol of authority. A dragon, we see explicitly in our text that we'll see today, it symbolizes the devil. The number 12, numbers are important symbols in apocalyptic literature. The number 12 almost always symbolizes the people of God. There were 12 tribes of Israel. There were, there were 12 apostles. It's a symbol of the people of God. Seven is a really important number because seven is the number of completion or perfection. There's seven days of the week. When you have all seven, you've had a full week, which goes far to explain the mystery behind the mark of the beast, 666 which is to say one less than seven, one less than seven, one less than seven, which is essentially to say, instead of perfect, imperfect, imperfect, imperfect. It is like the, the full expression of that which never is actually complete. And uh, we'll see uh, another symbolic number, 1260 days, which is the equivalent of three and a half years, which is the half of seven. So if you think of half of seven, if seven is perfect or complete, then half of that means it's utterly incomplete or most certainly not complete. Uh, An important other number, 10, which also means full or complete like it should be. Like, you know, when you have a baby, you you go in there for seniors, I want to count their fingers. Have you got 10 toes and 10 fingers? And they're all there. And and sometimes you'll see this number multiplied 10 times 10, or sometimes in the book of Revelation, 10 times 10 times 10, a thousand. And it's like uh, to say a thousand means just an an ongoing long time. It's almost like saying forever, the fullness of ongoing time. It's really important, therefore, that you don't don't, don't take all the symbols and make them literal. 
I mean, sometimes there are literal things that are being described in the book of Revelation, but there are all these symbols that people of the day would easily recognize as symbols. You know, I mean, we have things like, like if I said, I, uh, would you ever, you said, would you ever pull for Duke? And I said, not in a million years would I ever pull for Duke. Well, I don't mean by that, that after a million years and one day, then I would pull for Duke. It's a saying, it's a symbol. It is to say, is it not in the longest period of time that you can imagine? See, well, Revelation's full of that. Now let's carry that. And I want to show you uh, this, this marvelous text and uh, I, 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 wish I, I wish I could just take you all the way through the whole, the whole chapter, but we're going to go through the first part of it, and I'm going to show you what's so marvelous in the Christmas message about this. Revelation 12, verse 1, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. So woman, um, there's a lot of suggestions and interpretations. Catholic scholars say it must be Mary. Um, some cults have tried to claim it, like uh, Christian science has said it's, this is referencing their founder, Mary Baker Eddy. Um, uh, some say that the, the, the woman is Old Testament Israel. Some say it's the New Testament church. But as I said, the number 12 almost always represents the people of God. And so this woman with 12 stars, I think, is the total people of God, the redeemed of the Lord. And she's clothed with the sun. There's a brilliant glory about this woman, like there's a brilliant glory about the body of Christ and about who you are. This, this crown with these 12 stars, she's reigning. She has a crown. And, and I think this means to those Christians in the first century who are being persecuted, and it means to us also, beloved, this is a picture of who you are, the body of Christ. You're wearing a crown, and you'll wear a crown forever symbolically. It means that whether you feel like it or not, you're already reigning with Christ. Verse 2, she was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. So the woman, the body of Christ here, I think, is shown as a picture of groaning and travail because it's clear that there's going to come forth a child out of the people of God. Verse 3, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his head seven diadems. So dragon is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament uh, the, the, the Septuagint, and is, it is depicted as the evil sea monster that rises up out of the sea and symbolizes the kingdoms that oppress Israel. At one point, Pharaoh is called the great dragon. But here, we're told explicitly, and we'll see later in verse 9, the dragon is the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. These numbers, seven for the heads, ten for horns, seven diadems, or an ornamental crown, it doesn't mean that this creature has ultimate authority or that this, this devil has ultimate rule. It means instead that as far as evil is concerned, this, this dragon is the picture of absolute evil, total hatred, a spirit of of utter murder, total deception, and complete darkness. That's what it's a picture of. Verse 4, And his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, she might, he might devour it. The picture of the dragon sweeping away a third of the stars probably is taken from Daniel chapter 8 that refers to a little horn that grew great and then threw some of the stars down to the ground. And that image almost surely is referring to Antiochus Epiphanes IV, 170 years before Christ, who persecuted the Jews mercilessly and deliberately defiled the Jewish temple by putting in there an altar to Zeus and ordering that pigs, the detestable, unclean animal to the Jews, would be sacrificed right in the middle of the holy temple. Some of the Jews revolted in what was called the Maccabean Revolt, and they won. And they were able to get the temple back and cleanse it and restore proper temple sacrifices. The celebration of that victory is what Hanukkah is all about. 
So probably the sweeping down of the stars of heaven is a reference to that persecution and even the martyrdom, that there is a partial way in which the dragon, the devil, has brought great injury against the body of Christ, but it's not final, it's not full, and it's not ultimately victorious. So this dragon stood before the woman, recognizing that the birth would take place and sought to devour the child. Why? Why is this dragon, why is the devil so consumed with waiting to devour this child that's born? Well, to understand it, we go back to Genesis chapter 3, because this in many ways is the story of the Bible. Chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 14. After sin had entered the world, and God spoke about the consequences of this, he then turned to the serpent at verse 14, and he said, because you've done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all your days. And listen to verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So God was saying literally to the serpent, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed, between the seed of the woman and this serpent's seed. And what he's saying is that the seed of this woman is going to literally crush your head and all you'll do is strike his heel. We know that the seed of this woman ultimately is Jesus himself because of what Paul says in Galatians 3.16. He says, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to the one and your offspring, which is to say seed is the word here, who is Christ. So there's this enormous conflict between the devil and this seed of the woman who's clearly Christ, the Messiah. So from the beginning, the devil knew that a son would be born to a woman that would crush the serpent's head. And so that ancient serpent started watching and looking for that male child with the prospect of killing him before he could become a great ruler. Well, the first two sons were born, Cain and Abel, and when they were born, they brought off, after they were grown, they brought offerings to the Lord, and the Lord was pleased with Abel's offering, but not Cain's. And in a strange surprising, furious jealousy. I mean, we know there's sibling rivalry, but this is abhorrent. Cain just gets so jealous that he rises up and he kills Abel. Why, why, why is this? It's because he has been inspired by the devil. 1 John three twelve says, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. In other words, Cain killed his brother because he was being motivated by that dragon who thought that maybe, this is what I think happened, Satan didn't know who the Messiah was going to be and thought, well, maybe since the Lord approved of Abel's offering, maybe Abel is the seed of the woman that's going to crush the serpent's head. And so he inspired, he filled Cain with hatred and fury and Cain killed Abel. The dragon is waiting to devour the son, but Abel wasn't that son. And God spoke a promise to Abraham that he would have a son. His seed would be blessed and his, his seed would be as numerous as the stars of the heaven. And so the dragon knew that there was a son that was going to come from Abraham's seed. And he watched and he waited. And Abraham had a son named Isaac who had twin boys named Esau and Jacob. And when Jacob was blessed by the Lord and Esau, blessed by his father instead of Esau, Esau became so furious that he wanted to kill his brother. The Bible says he comforted himself with thoughts of murdering Jacob. I mean, again, I understand the sibling rivalry but and jealousy, but but to want to just kill him because he was blessed? I think what's happening is that the dragon is seeking to devour and maybe thinks because Jacob was so blessed, maybe he's the seed of the woman that's going to crush the serpent's head. And so he seeks to devour him, and he entered into Esau, and Esau hated his brother. But Jacob survived. And Jacob had these uh, eventually 12 sons, but first he had 11 sons, the youngest of which was a, a boy named Joseph. And Joseph saw, saw things in the heavens. Joseph had dreams. And he told his brothers about a dream. And, and in, in, in the dream, he saw the sun and the moon and 11 stars bowing down to him. And when the brothers heard about the dream, the Bible said they wanted to kill Joseph. Do you see what's happening? That every time there's someone that looks anointed... 
That every time it looked, it looked like someone might be the seed of the woman, there's a spirit of murder that rises up against them. Why? Because this ancient serpent is so consumed and preoccupied with fear and worry that someone would crush his head. He's always trying to devour that child. The Hebrew people prospered in Egypt, but a king arose who didn't know Joseph and made life hard on the Hebrews and enslaved them and oppressed them, but they kept multiplying. So the evil king of Egypt told some Hebrew midwives, Shifra and, Shifra and Pua, he said, I want you to kill all the male babies that are born to the Hebrews, but they refused. And the Hebrew children kept being born and kept growing. So Pharaoh became so furious that he told the general population of Egypt, if you see a son who's born to the Hebrews, you can throw him into the Nile. He made it legal to just go and murder a Jewish boy. How could there be such hatred? Why well, want to kill all these baby boys? The reason is the ancient serpent is always standing by looking to see who is the seed of the woman trying to devour that child. But God sent a deliverer, a man named Moses, Moses, and the people were set free. And eventually, that people became a nation. And a man after God's own heart was appointed to lead the people. His name was David, and he defeated a giant named Goliath. And the people chanted their affection for David. And it must have been that the dragon thought, this is the anointed one. Because Saul became demonized, the previous king, and tried to kill David over and over again. A thousand years later, the old serpent is still worried, and he's still consumed with a mission to devour the Messiah before he could crush the serpent's head. And one day, a demon comes and reports to Satan that there's a huge entourage of wealthy magi from the east who have gone to Jerusalem to look for a newborn king. And the devil sought out who is the best person to release in fury against this potential newborn king and he found the most self-centered man in the land. Herod had a bodyguard of 2,000 men. He was paranoid. He was so paranoid that Herod killed his own sons so that they could never take his place of rulership. And the devil would use Herod who said, where is he the one who was born king of the Jews? I want to worship him too. He lied. And the devil was waiting, working through Herod, watching waiting to devour the son, who this time was the seed of the woman. But God warned Joseph, and the baby Jesus was spared. So what did Herod do? He turned his fury towards all the male babies like Pharaoh. He said, if I can't find them, I'll kill them all. And so all the children in Bethlehem under age two were murdered by a demonized tyrant. But baby Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and was called back out of Egypt where he'd been hiding and went on to confront the devil, devil in the wilderness and everywhere he went to cast out demons. And Jesus said, if you see me casting out evil spirits by the finger of God, you will know that the kingdom of God is at hand. And so what happened, we see in this Revelation chapter 12 again at verse 5, is this woman, this is a picture of the people of God, out of her comes the male child, one who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. The strongest thing known in that era, iron cannot be beat. But her child... Jesus was caught up to God and to his throne. He wasn't killed. He was resurrected and he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And the woman, the church, the people of God fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God for which she is to be nourished for 1260 days, three and a half years, a symbol of not a long full time, but a limited time. That's what he's saying. For a limited time, the ancient serpent, the dragon, Satan, has turned his attention towards the people of God since he could not kill the child. And that's what all persecution arises from. And at verse 7, we realize war arose in heaven, and Michael and his angels are fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And there's no longer any place for them in heaven. So a huge cosmic shift takes place after this child who the devil tried to kill wasn't killed, but instead was raised from the dead, ascended to heaven. And the devil wasn't able to devour the child. And the seed of the woman has delivered a crushing blow to the headship of the devil, just as the Lord prophesied in Genesis chapter 3. 
And so these demons are wicked angels, and there was a war that was going on, angel against angel, and it was a real battle until the child that was taken up to God, until he was ascended, until that happened. And when that happened, suddenly the dragon was thrown down, lost his place in heaven, and had no legal ground to be there anymore. He lost his status, verse 9. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with them. The devil and the demons were thrown out of heaven. You don't have a right to be here anymore, God said. What happened to bring this cosmic shift? Verse 10, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser. That's what, that's what, that's what the devil's name means. Uh, the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, for they loved their lives. They loved not their lives even unto death. So the devil didn't kill Jesus. Jesus laid down his life to take the penalty due to us. And you know what happened on the cross? Just as God has said in Genesis, this is what happened. The serpent bit the heel, injected the poison. The, the, the sinless one became sin for our sake, and he died in our place. And before the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, before you became a Christian, before the blood of Jesus had been shed for you and you had been totally forgiven and justified in God's eyes, then the devil, the prosecutor, the accuser always had some kind of right to say, Judgment ought to be brought against this sinner. But when you're in Christ, when you have the finished work of Jesus on your side, when you have the ascended Lord interceding for you, there is no case the devil can make against you. There is no prosecution that can take place against you. It's all been thrown out of court. The devil doesn't even have a place in the court anymore. Punishment has already taken place and Jesus has had it. And that's why we win by the, by the blood of the Lamb and our testimony that we speak of. And we don't don't worry about even death itself because we're guaranteed victory forever and forever. What I'm saying, people of God, is that this Christmas season, as much as ever before, what we need to remember is that we reign with Christ, and though we fight the battle and we keep our pads on and the battle might look close, keep your eyes on the scoreboard. Don't forget the first half because it's already been decided. Jesus Christ is the victor, and you in Christ are victorious with him. And that, in the end, is the message of Christmas, and that's the gospel. On Mary's lap is sleeping Whom angels greet with anthems sweet While shepherds watch our keeping This, this is Christ the King Whom shepherds God and angels see Oh,
I don't know what a life has been like for you during this arduous, challenging year. Some have suffered loss. Some have been up against great adversities. Others, um, it seems like it's been smooth sailing by the grace of God. But what we all know is that if you only look at the world around you, you could think, is God really winning? You, you could be in a second half of a football game, and it looks like it could go either way if you didn't know what had happened in the first half. If you don't know the end from the beginning, and you don't know and think much about what Jesus has already accomplished, it could feel discouraging. But beloved, be not dismayed. Jesus Christ is on the throne that ancient serpent has already been hurled down out of heaven, and his time is short, and God is with us. And I'm just praying for each and every one of you, whatever your particular challenges are right now, that this message of Christmas, the message of God coming and not being devoured by the enemy, but instead crushing the enemy's head, that somewhere in the midst of the beauty and the quiet and the sugar cake and the coffee and the ornaments and, the, and hopefully some sweet, sweet time with, with family members, that in the midst of it you remember cosmically the battle rages on, but the war has already been won. Especially important message, if you've yet to ever say yes to the saving love of Jesus Christ, the only way that that prosecutor's voice of condemnation will ever be silenced is for you to know that you know that you know that your sins have been forgiven. And you can say yes to the saving work of Jesus Christ. You can say yes in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, and you will be a child of God assured of victory forever. God rest you, Mary, all of you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and be kind and gracious to you and make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace today and every day forevermore. Amen.